Hello, everyone, and welcome to Office Hours Live with the Meter Environment team. Today's session will focus on weather data, and we're shooting for about an hour of live Q&A with our experts here, Drs. Doug Kobos and Chris Chambers, whom I'll introduce in just a moment. But before we start, we've got a couple of housekeeping items. First, we want this session to be interactive, of course, so we encourage you to submit any and all questions in the questions pane, and we will try to get to all of your questions. If we don't, which we more than likely won't. Someone from our science or support team will get back to you with an answer via the email you registered with. Second, if you want us to go back or repeat something you missed, don't worry. We will be emailing you a recording of this session uh, within the next three to five business days. All right, with all of that out of the way, let's get started. Today, our panelists here are research scientist, Dr. Doug Kobos and application specialist, Chris Chambers. Doug is the Director of Research and Development at Meter Environment. He also holds an adjunct appointment in the Department of, Soil, of Crop and Soil Sciences at Washington State University, where he co-teaches environmental biophysics. His master's degree from Texas A&M and PhD from the University of Minnesota focused on field scale fluxes of CO2 and mercury, respectively. He was hired here at Meter to be the lead engineer in charge of designing the thermal and electrical conductivity probe that flew to Mars aboard NASA's 2008 Phoenix Scout Lander. His current research is centered on instrumentation development for soil and plant sciences. And Chris Chambers operates as the support manager here at Meter Group. He specializes in ecology and plant physiology and has over 13 years of experience helping researchers measure the soil plant atmosphere continuum. All right, so thanks for joining us, everybody. All right, let's get started. We're going to take some questions here. And just remember that you can submit questions at any time, and we will be able to answer them um, uh, first come, first serve. So we do have some questions here. First off, um, we've had a bunch of questions about uh, sensor selection. And um, so maybe we can use some of these first questions to kind of hit that topic. But um, a lot of people asking um, how many sensors to use when they're taking uh, weather data? Um, what are the other types of measurements that they would need to accompany weather data? Um, whether or not having an all-in-one station um, is better compared to a, a station that has several separate sensors. So Chambers and Doug, maybe we could hit that, that kind of uh, sensor topic first. Good morning, Doug. Good morning, Chambers. Oh, sorry, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so let's go ahead and get started. It's a pleasure to be with you all this morning um, or whatever time of day it is, wherever you are. Um, so the first question we've got queued up here is what are the advantages of using soil moisture as an ancillary measurement and how many sensors do I need? So if we're primarily interested in weather, why would we measure soil moisture? Well, it's, I mean, the, the biggest factor there for me, Chambers, is that, um, the soil moisture is a real driver of weather events and, and is a, a forcing factor that, that actually is one of the controlling factor, factors of the weather. So mm -hmm. if you're operating a big network and you're trying to do any kind of prediction, then, then understanding the surface soil moisture especially um, and, and how available that water is to come out into the atmosphere is going gonna, is gonna to affect things tremendously. So I think the big weather networks are really keying in on this over time. Right. And if you're doing hydrological modeling or that storage component for soil moisture, it's, it's what's hanging around. So yep. in your profile, yep. uh, you really need that measurement for, um, for a water balance uh, yep. or, or a hydrological model. Yeah, and then getting back to your you know, uh, plant science roots, I mean, if you're doing anything, if your network or your, your observations uh, have anything to do with, with plants, then you have to know the availability right. of water for, for transpiration and, and, and photosynthesis. That's right. We always needed uh, this type of data. Uh, you can't tell very much about the plant water status unless you know what's in the soil, unless you know what the inputs are. Yep. And frequently those measurements are, especially when I was doing actively doing research, uh, you know, your weather station could be miles away. Yeah. Um, how about how many sensors do I need specifically for soil moisture? Tag, you're it. Oh, okay. That's the age-old <laughs> question, right? I, I guess, yeah. Um, so especially if you're just measuring up with where you're measuring weather, 
um, you're probably going to want some kind of profile. And it really depends on the questions, questions that you're asking or what you intend to do with the data. Um, so uh, a lot of weather networks already have soil moisture data. If you want to make your data available in a national or a statewide network, then look at what uh, look at what is already in the database. There's probably recommendations for how many sensors you need and at what depths. Yep. The Snowtel sites, um, state mesonets, they all have guidelines, the National Soil and Moisture Network. Um, and if you're not going to use or don't want your data to be avail available in one of those uh, networks, then what kind of question, questions are you asking? Are you trying to uh, validate the data based off of validate some satellite data mm -hmm. or do you want to know what's in the root zone do you don't want to know what's escaping the root zone um, you may or may not need that many sensors uh, but think about the questions that you're asking and what you want to do with the data yeah and all those things you touch on you know would determine if you want to scatter your sensors spatially or if you want to go vertical for a um you know a, a, profile, a profile or some combination of both yeah. so i mean there's a lot of a lot of different options there so really i mean actually with any environmental measurement the the take home is you, you make sure you you understand what you're trying to to measure and what you, the data products are that you're trying to get first and then set up your installation you exactly know, with that exactly all right, shall we right. move on? Um, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, so all-in-one versus separate. Oh, we can um, we can touch on that a little bit yeah. if, if you want, Brad. Mm -hmm. that, that's actually a good question. So, you know, recently a lot of all-in-one weather stations have, have come on the market, and, and they certainly have their advantages, but they also have their disadvantages. Mm -hmm. um, the Many of the weather standards, including World Meteorological Organization, call for measurements at different heights, right? So your, your rain measurement needs to be close to the surface and shielded from the wind. Your um, wind speed measurements need to be be higher up. And so you cannot accomplish that with an all-in-one. Mm -hmm. that, that is really the, the biggest drawback of the all-in-one. Um, however, the all-in-one stations are extremely convenient and are what WMO would call fit for purpose, right? That um, for a lot of weather networks and a lot of um, uh, microenvironment monitoring and a lot of, you know, field scale measurements or plot scale measurements, they're a really, really nice option. Mm -hmm. It just depends on, um, you know, if you need to adhere to a certain standard and, and in some ways uh, the quality of, of the data or the accuracy. So you're not going to find an all-in-one that has a class A pyranometer. So if you need, right. you know, stuff like that. that or net radiation yep. or something like that. Exactly. Um, yeah. But uh, in the defend, in the bonus column of the one-on-one, all-in-one weather stations, then, uh, you know, they are really simple to put together. Um, basically, you're just mounting one unit on the top of the pole, maybe with a data logger. Uh, and data management as well, having just all of those measurements come into uh, one port of your data logger really lets you do a lot more with your data yeah, logger. True. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Let's see. We've got, um, uh, we, we do have several questions asking about installation. So maybe we could cover this topic next. Um, just number one, is there a general guide for installation of weather stations? And then there's some other spe specific uh, uh, questions that we can get to. But first, yeah, kind of overall general guideline for installation. Yeah, you brought up the World Meteorological Organization, or mm -hmm. WMO. Yep. Um, they have it extensive guidelines on, on siting for measuring the weather the bulk weather parameters most accurately and, and many other standards organizations the association of state climatologists NOAA, um you know all of these organizations have really solid recommendations on how to get the best weather data possible but um those recommendations really are tailor-made for um meteorolog meteorological and climatological and weather observations but if you get into some specialty networks and some specialty uses mm -hmm. like maybe urban networks then then those recommendations aren't going to to serve those needs very well right and uh you know 
it depends what you're measuring too for whether especially your location is going to be very important because uh, you could wind up um, you could wind up measuring a microclimate yep yep which it. if you want weather that's not going to be uh, really what you want to be measuring yeah that I mean that brings up an, an anecdote that, that the microclimates are are extremely important um, we ha- we had a situation here where we have a test bed on on our rooftop which is not a valid um, <laughs> a meteorological observation but it is a, a handy place for us to be able to test all our instrumentation mm-hmm. and about 200 meters away um, down the hill a little bit toward toward the creek we also have some instrumentation deployed and on clear nights when we get inversion conditions and cold air drainage the the low temperature can be uh, different by as much as 10 degrees C. So we're talking about tremendous differences in, in, in uh, weather variables due just to sighting. So you do need to pay attention to this. It's, it's a big deal. All right. Um, we did have a, a new question pop in here, and maybe we'll come back to installation stuff in a, in a second. Uh, do you have any specific sensors for profiling wind as regards to wind shear or microburst in accordance to WMO standards? Do you know of any? Yeah, I think that, that you would just need to do that with um, with individual sensors, that you'd have to create a profile with, with multiple sensors at the different heights to be able to, to try and capture those. And, and I'm not sure what they do at the um, at airports in terms of, of looking at, at wind shear and, and, and things like that. That's a little bit outside my knowledge zone. Mm-hmm. All right. Okay. Um, a couple more installation questions. Uh, one was just asking about in, enclosures. Um, so are there good ways to, uh, to enclose your, your station that would be acceptable? Like if you've got it in the middle of some rangeland mm-hmm. and want to keep the cattle from yep. like completely tearing it down. Yep, you better or, do it. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> they will. <laughs> That's right. Um, and we've seen this frequently with um, you can put some chain link fences around it. You do want to be careful that you're not biasing the reading or yep. impacting the reading, and um, I don't know off the top of my head what the what the safest distance is. Definitely below your your station, right? Yeah. So if you're if you're you know using a, a kind of a not not really a standard, but a, a lot of people do their make their their measurements at two meters height. WMO calls out ten meters for wind speed and some other mm-hmm. things. But you definitely want to keep your um, your fence, your chain link, or whatever kind of fence it is below that level, so you're mm-hmm. not influencing the the wind field. But uh, I mean, it would be a pretty tall fence to go two meters anyway, so it's not really mm-hmm. a big deal. I think that that most um, installations will have some type of fencing to keep the animals out because animals are really really difficult on on instrumentation right pretty indiscriminate they can discriminate sometimes <laughs> maybe shiny. they can yeah shiny <laughs> and they, well they they also would tend to chew on your wires and knock stuff down so yeah i would definitely um recommend that you put some kind of exclosure around that mm-hmm. all right okay um we've got a big we've got a big question here um that just popped in. All right, so this one they're asking about uh, gap filling. Okay. Um, and and I'm, we're gonna read through this, we're gonna see if we can work through this. Um, their, their main question here at the end, uh, is there a good procedure on how to do, how to gap fill in weather data, um, those kinds of things. But here's, their, here's their, uh, their question here, saying that they've got two weather stations uh, about 800 meters apart at their experimental site. Part of the applications for the weather data is to be used as input for crop simulation. So we do have a lot of other uh, crop-related questions that maybe we can touch on later as well. Uh, it's a rain-fed cropping system. Uh, we typically use the weather data, so solar radiation, etc. They've listed a whole bunch here. And daily time steps. The data needs to be complete. If a day is missing, the model doesn't run. So therefore, we need to do some gap filling in the weather station data mm-hmm. so it can be useful. Uh, so far, we mutually fill the missing data in these two stations because we see the variable measurements, except for rain, are very close to each mm-hmm. other. But then we still have the remaining gaps. So for now, the best idea was to fill it in with a nearby weather station about nine kilometers away. So is there a good procedure, again, on gap filling weather data? We know rainfall varies spatially, but then what's best? Do we use the weather station from nine you know, kilometers away, or do you have any other suggestions? Oh, that's a really tricky one. Yeah, it is. I th- when I... When I um, 
uh, first heard gap filling, I thought you were talking about uh, spatial Spatially. gap filling, yeah. but this is temporal gap filling, and that is that is the the most difficult one, of course. Which you know, if you're using, you know, you don't have data where you are, then it becomes a spatial problem. Too, yeah, yes. Yeah. Nine kilometers is a long way away to infer your precipitation in many cases. Yeah. So for the for the um, weather data that that they listed, it sounds like. Uh, they may be calculating reference evapotranspiration from mm-hmm. from those measurements, and so, you know, I, I think that when both stations are out, then and you're stuck, then using the nearest weather station, you know, is is probably the best way to do it. If you had a data scientist on your staff or or wanted to do a little bit of data science work, you could probably determine the bias. Um, between that station that's nine kilometers away and your two stations that that are in the location that you care about, don't know if that's really um, uh, you know a, you put a an possibility. asterisk by the by those data points or some kind of class variable so that yeah. you can separate them out in the analysis later or see if they pop out as an outlier yeah. or something. But if you're just calculating you know ETO, then that station nine kilometers away, if you just have limited um, data gaps, then the accumulation of error in your evapotranspiration should be relatively small. So if you're only looking at a few hours here, a few hours there, then then it shouldn't jack your ET um, measurements up too badly to do that. But the rainfall one is that the the, the statement that um, rainfall is is inherently variable over space is a really good one, and that's one that's often overlooked in in, in the literature, in people's thinking, but but rainfall is highly variable spatially, and that's probably yeah. the biggest potential error that you're going to have. It comes is, up in support all the time, yeah, too. It's yeah. like, oh, this, this rain, you know, this precipitation gauge, the three miles away got just a deluge, and then... Uh, the station here didn't get any precipitation. Yeah, exactly. What's wrong with yeah? What's going on? The the, the 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 station out at the airport that, that Noah uses, you know, said that I got you know three centimeters of rain, and, and and I'm still dry out here. What's going on? Well, you know, it's 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 highly variable. So mm-hmm. so there's not really a great way to um, to fill the gap there unless you had maybe access to some uh, radar models. So that I think that the um, radar estimates of rainfall at a particular location are getting better and better. And so you might be able to feed those in. I don't know where those data are available um, publicly, though. All right. Good job, you guys. Let's see. Um, so that that question was covering tangentially um, some some issues with insulation in farmland or, or dealing with, with crops and those kinds of things. Um, is there anything different? There's one question here that popped up as well saying, is, is there anything, any different guidelines for installing uh, weather stations uh, in agricultural research or with growers or consultants of growers, those kinds of things? Yeah, well, <laughs> the, the rule of thumb there is, is, is place it where you, where you want the measurements to be made. So, you know, if you're doing, if you're worried about frost, then you need to put it right in your, in your orchard. If you're worried about, you know, rainfall in a particular field, then definitely put it in that field. I mean, you want it to be as close as possible to the, to the environment that you're trying to measure. If you're measuring ET? If you're measuring ET? ET model? Yep. You better get some fetch and you better, better get it um, close to your, to the crops of interest. No, in that case, would you rather have it like in a in a crop that you use for a reference or maybe in a meadow right next door, well, something well watered, you know, some of the models assume a well watered lawn. They, the ET, yeah, the Penman Monteith does, it does assume a well watered um, reference crop, either alfalfa or grass. Mm-hmm. And so putting that, you know, getting it in a representative location that, um, that, um, that represents those conditions would be a good idea. <clears throat> I was going to say there's a couple you were talking about ET. Uh, there's a couple questions in here uh, asking about uh, uh, calculating ET. And this particular question is asking for for grapes and other high value crops. Um, do you have any other? But in general, do you have any other mm-hmm. suggestions for for generating ET uh, within, you know, within these these specific crops? Well, one of the nice things about um, the Penman Monteith model that you suggested is that you can calculate an ET based off of standard standard um, weather readings. Mm-hmm. You don't need super specialized equipment. 
um, your radiation, your temperature, your relative humidity, wind speed. Uh, if, if you have those things, then you can get an estimate of ET. There are more precise ways to do it, uh, but those can run pretty expensive by the time you put a full a flux tower or something. Together. Sure. Yeah, and if you rely on the crop coefficients, if you if you mm -hmm. you know have a pretty good handle on what your crop coefficients are, then you can get at the the actual ET. Um, I see in this question though that they're also asking about using soil moisture to to back check um, that evapotranspiration, and that is actually a really good idea because any kind of bias that you have in your in your either in your location of your weather station or in the weather measurements will mm -hmm. create a systematic over or under estimation in the um, calculated evapotranspiration or any error in your crop coefficient will lead to a, to a bias that accumulates over time. And so having a, a ground check to How check that, that yeah, it's to, almost a pun to see that <laughs> <laughs> to to check the soil moisture. It'll tell you how much to look at is your changing. storage pool. Yep. Yeah, yep. And that that is a, it's. I mean, soil moisture is a really nice integrator of of what has happened uh, ab above. You know, in terms of evapotranspiration, in terms of precipitation. So, mm -hmm. so if you have that um, that information on the soil moisture, it, it really helps you do that do that ground truth and maybe adjust your your measurements to account for any of that bias right. over time. Right. All right, um, let's talk about some maintenance questions here. Um, uh, just in general, I mean, we've got a lot of questions about just general maintenance, uh, about calibration, recalibration, uh, support services, other things like that. Mm -hmm. um, just in general, how about how about this one here? Uh, just what is the recommended maintenance for your weather station, or in particular for our you know meters Atmos forty one? Yeah, so that, that's a really good question, and this is something that is, that is pretty important. Um, some of the sensors that you're going to find on pretty much any weather setup um, have some drift over time, and so we try and quantify that and give some recommendations as to when things need to be recalibrated or need to be switched out. So mm -hmm. specifically in terms of the Atmos 41, which is our, our little um, all-in-one there is a small daughter board that houses the relative humidity, vapor pressure, and barometric pressure chips. And so the calibration is stored on those. And so we recommend that you change those out every year or every two years. Every two years. Yeah, at, yep. at, the, at the worst. And so this is something that takes about, oh, I don't know, six, seven minutes. You can do it in the field. All you need to do is get another um, one of those daughter boards from us, and you can change it in the field and get your measurements spot on. But it's uh, a weather station. Even if you had cloud, have cloud access and can keep your eyes on the data all the time, you still need to put some thought into maintenance. You bet. Um, precipitation, rain gauges, rain funnels get clogged up. Nobody has figured out how to keep uh, rain gauges from getting no clogged up. No one that we know of anyway. Um, we weighing gauges, I suppose. But, but of course, those, um, those are accumulating, you know, it, bird poop. It, and, it just and, r gets right in there. <laughs> yeah, then, and mouse uh, bodies. You still need to get in there and check it out. Um, so yeah, every two years, uh, with the Atmos 41s, you can send it in. We'll do a full calibration service, uh, do a new calibration certificate for you, check all the measurements, make sure they're okay. If you want to keep your device in the field, the ones, uh, the, the measurements that tend to drift, mm -hmm. like Doug said, we have field replaceable components yeah, for those. Yeah, that includes the solar radiation as well. You can switch solar that. Solar radiation and relative humidity. Yeah, those are really, really the two big ones, but you know, aside from just the calibration, the mm -hmm. maintenance issues that the chambers talked about going out there, clean out your rain gauge, make sure it's clean, mm -hmm. get the cobwebs out of your, you know, sonic anemometer path, make yep. sure that there's no ants or, you know, wasps trying to nest in it. So the, the regular site visits are always a bonus. Okay. Not always necessary if until things happen but you're going to be better off if you if you send a send a student out or a technician occasionally and if you see something in the data then definitely go out yeah, and check for sure. it, especially the precipitation um your uh, the the atmos 41 has accelerometers on it they can give you some information about what's happening out there uh if you see something odd maybe it's fallen over got hit by operations or something like that so I, just another anecdote, I have a, a, a buddy here who's a local farmer that they've um, uh, let us do a whole lot of testing on, on some of their alfalfa. And so, so I 
we got them in Atmos 41 and, and he was complaining, oh man, you know, we got, again, that same precipitation thing. Oh, they got half an inch of rain and, and I only, and I only measured a, you know, a 10th of an inch what's going on. And so I walked over to his weather station and popped the, the funnel off and, and it was about, a, I don't know, two centimeters thick bird poo and, oh, and dust no. and they're just completely That's, plugged. So great. yeah. So make sure you, if you see an anomaly and you have questions, get out there and check it out. We've got the hawks out here that oh, build man. nests right next to it and they loved to perch on the rain gauges and they eat do. mice. They so do. So you go to your rain gauge and you find a half-eaten mouse inside there. That's, that's not that's not going to help your never good for your data. No. Lovely. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> um, how about this? How about the importance of support? So, uh, I mean, th this comment here is, you know, very important value is support. Many, many purchases that you make, you know, on Amazon or other places, there's no support associated. Can you guys just talk about the, the importance of, of support in, in maintaining your weather station or other, other sensors? Things are going to go wrong. Eventually. Invariably. Eventually. Things are going to go wrong. Yeah. It, it, it will happen at some point. And, and, you know, if you if you have a whole weather setup, then you've got a whole bunch of sensors out there, and at some point you're going to get some questionable data. And if you don't have somebody who's a domain expert to help you either interpret that or tell you how to fix it, then you're kind of stuck. To check out your data, see if it's if it's reason, if the sensor looks like it's working within specification, it might be something like clean out the funnels or. Uh, you know, sometimes instrumentation uh, it does have a problem and needs to come in for service. And you look at these all-in-one weather stations, it's easy to look at them as, well, it's just one it's just one instrument, right? Well, it's actually got nine different sensors on there. Right. Um, any of which, you know, can in, in encounter problems over the life of a, of a sensor suite. You bet. You bet. And, and there are some things that, that people like Chambers and, and Jeff Ritter and, mm -hmm. and, and that support team here, they see time and time again. And so they can really save you a lot of, um, of time and, and heartache if you'll just send an email or, or break off a call and say, hey, something, mm -hmm. something funny's happening. Well, yeah. if you're seeing your rainfall, you know, trickle through at one millimeter per hour, you know, for several days after your rainfall event, that means you have a plugged funnel. And Go we have some recommendations it. on how to check your funnel, uh, or how to check the precipitation. Yep. Um, so that you can you can have a quantitative test and see if your instrument is actually measuring in the field. Um, and if you do the test and it's fine, then you have some other variable that's affecting your your data and not the instrument. And then you can eliminate that as yep. a source of error. All right. Um, there was another question just came in, kind of piggybacking, piggybacking off of previous discussions uh, regarding soil moisture, uh, getting soil moisture readings with your weather data. And they were just asking, what tools do you recommend for installing sensors, including our Taro sensors? Are there any special requirements, especially when you when you were dealing with with soil moisture in conjunction with with your weather station? We could do a whole seminar on this. Yeah, whole have we? Session. Have we not? I think we have at various stages. <laughs> um, in, in just in the the short version, uh, making sure that you get good contact with the soil is generally the single most important thing that yep. you can do uh, to get good soil moisture data. Um, and know something about your soil. Uh, if you're doing water content, take a soil sample because interpreting soil and moisture generally needs that soil type information as well. Yep. Um, so determining what depths, uh, how many sensors you wanna get out, and then, and then having the smallest possible impact on your, on your site while getting the best contact with the soil yep. your sensors is, is where you want to focus your efforts. We have spent, well, as you know, we've spent a lot of time trying to come up with installation techniques that, that do both of those things, that make sure that the sensor mm -hmm. is installed into undisturbed soil and you have the, yep. the least um, site disturbance as possible. And so, I mean, if, if you guys are interested, get on the website and look up our borehole installation tool. And we're still working on that. We're yeah. Not done oh, yeah, we've got we're iteration number two. Better, better, cheaper installation tools. Yep. Very low disturbance, perfect installation down several meters. It's, it's, I mean, this may not be so, so important for a lot of the, the 
weather related um, soil moisture measurements because most mm -hmm. of those would be at shallower depths, but down to about a meter is yeah. generally the <clears throat> deepest. All right. Okay, we're going to switch gears, and there's some questions uh, regarding uh, data in general. Um, so, this, let's see. How about let's do this one first. How do how do we correct overestimates of air temperature due to the instruments Ooh. heating due to sunshine? Well, I can I can tell you for sure that we've done a webinar on that one. So yep. so if you if you know the solar radiation load on your sensor, and if you know the wind speed. And also, well, you need to know the, the reflectivity and, the, and the, the size of the sensor, but you can use first principles energy balance to understand um, how much your air temperature would heat up um, over ambient temperature if it's it, sitting in the sunshine. And this is where all-in-ones really shine because... Yeah, because you, ha you have that information. Yeah. Well, if your all-in-one has a solar radiation sensor, most don't. But um, but the ones that do have a solar radiation sensor, you could, you could correct that. You're going to be better off, though, typically making sure that you have a radiation shield and, and keeping the sun off it. But but even then, you can get some pretty substantial errors under low wind speed. And, That's right. And, uh, and high the comparison radiation. models with the Atmos 41's correction generally do better than non-aspirated shields. Absolutely do better than non-aspirated shields. I mean, you can get a couple of degree temperature difference between air temperature and your sensor temperature, even if it's in a radiation shield, if that radiation shield isn't aspirated. Mm -hmm. So the, the precipitation variability and then um, air temperature measurement are the two that I think that most people take for granted and, and overlook the errors that can accumulate there if, if you're not careful. Outs to the measurement. You bet. That we try to make easy and so that you don't have to worry about that. That's right. Thing. Yep. It's our job. Mm -hmm. All right. And this next one is asking, how important is metadata for the representativity of the data series and model calculations? What's metadata again? <laughs> metadata. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> metadata, the higher data, the supporting data. All right. Yeah. So um, I think that this is another one that's often overlooked. That, I mean, mm -hmm. if you don't have the supporting data to, to tell you where your measurement is, the height of the measurement, you know, what the vegetation is near the, near the site, then, then your data often lose a lot of meaning. And so... And this is where you might not be able to use your data to infer what you're hoping to infer. Right. Like, if you've got features nearby, you may be measuring microclimate instead of weather, uh, and that your data may be just specific to that spot, and you can't make larger inferences about uh, about the weather at that area. Right. So we've we've done a lot. Well, we have a lot of ideas, and we've enacted about half of them in our in our Zentra system to allow. Um, the metadata to be stored along with the data records. So you're able to input mm -hmm. the, the height or depth of your measurement, the, the GPS coordinates of the measurement are automatically stored there. And then we've spent quite a bit of time recently um, uh, having all of our sensors be smart sensors. So the sensors themselves will tell you if there's a problem with their calibration. They'll tell you if there's a problem with the measurement. They'll tell you if um, uh, maybe a, a sensor has, has broken and they've had to revert to a, a sub-sensor that's less accurate. So all of those data come through in the, um, in the data stream. And, and I think that that is pretty helpful for some of the big network operators, especially to be mm -hmm. able to have some automated QA, QC on the data stream when, when the sensor and the system reports and says, hey, I've got a problem. Right. Yeah. Right. All right. Um, let's see. We're all, I think we're going to come back. Um, we, we have had, coming back to insulation, we have had a lot of questions People concerned about leveling sensors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there any any little insights you can give about? We've got people talking about weather stations, par sensors, anemometers, uh, other things like that. Any any mm -hmm. insights there? Yeah, level is good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is next, next question. Brad. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Do you remember the spec? How far out of level is it before you run into a problem? Well, so so I can speak specifically for the Atmos Forty One with our um, with our rainfall measurement. Some drops have to hit a couple of electrodes, and and it's about three degrees off mm. level that you start missing those. We tell everybody too, don't touch, um, to to try and give a little bit of um, of safety factor there. But 
also your your wind speed, your precipitation catch wind areas, direction, wind, wind direction, yeah. your solar radiation, all of those things are going to accumulate errors if you're not perfectly level. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty good idea to look at your bubble level or actually in, in, in our get instruments. Get your pole level. Yeah, get your pole level, look at the bubble level on the instrument or in the Atmos line we have um, uh, accelerometers level sensors in there that so you you will see your level data come through in the data stream and you know if you set a flag or if you look at that you can tell if you have a problem and get back out and re-level your your sensor yep so yeah but that is important brad all right i'm glad i asked it then all right um uh, another maintenance question our battery levels are giving us a lot of issues any tricks to keeping stations running that are dropping below 50 percent battery power so this crosses over into data logging and yep. data management. And um, as, a, I, as a system with the Atmos 41 and the ZL6, it is uh, power management is critical. Um, we try to make that as, as behind the scenes as possible with solar panels and uh, the recharging and rechargeable batteries and all that. Um, but again, you are in the field and you're transmitting to a cell tower. And in most cases, mm -hmm. your cell reception is going to determine uh, how, uh, what your power budget that's is. That's right. And so if you've got a device that's out just on the edge of cell service, and it's trying and trying to get signals, and then it has to do a bunch of retries to, because it's got a poor signal. And then it's <laughs> there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes with uh, cell signal strength too, and it can vary at a site um, between 25 and 50% in any given case. So um, definitely managing your cell transmissions is one of the is one of the tricky parts about that. Yep. Um, we also have some good tools. Sometimes the sensor is the problem and it's drawing more current. And uh, we have some tools on how to actually measure if the sensor is operating within uh, within specification yep and that's the zsc bluetooth reader. yep yep so we we put that functionality in one other that um just came up recently uh had a cosmic ray neutron sensor that was running on a on a zl6 and the batteries were going down there's no reason that the batteries should have been going down on this and so um i will make the statement that birds are pretty indiscriminate with where they poop. it's not just <laughs> rain gauges where they where they like to to go but that the solar panels can get um, get pretty gummed up with bird poo too if you're if you're not careful. So and we've had an canopies grow up over. Oh yeah, over. Hmm. I, I put this thing out. Oh yeah, some in, in the tropics. Right in <laughs> yeah. Two months later, uh, the solar panels completely blocked yep. by solar yep. radiation. All right. Um, this next one is a suggestion or feedback or or something that that this uh, commenter has has seen. They say that it seems that all-in-one systems like the Atmos 41 can be teamed with ancillary powered heated rain gauges or unpowered chemical snow melting mm -hmm. gauges to get four season performance. Can you guys talk a little bit about that potential? Yeah, I mean, that that is a really good strategy to extend your your precipitation measurement, which is the primary reason that, that the Atmos 41 wouldn't be called a four season um, measurement, that it, it really, under frozen precipitation conditions, it's not going to, to, to get you any information. So if you have a secondary measurement to measure the rain um, or the snow, then that is a really great idea. Um, may not path. get all the way there, yeah, because yeah. your your wind path can get um, gummed up with snow and filled with snow under some conditions, and that's a really tricky one because even you know your your anemometers that claim to be four season, you know your your um, oh. Uh, cup anemometers or propeller anemometers, those also struggle a lot when you have, you know, blowing snow and accumulating ice. Those can give you also no information when they get frozen. And so we skied past a snow tail uh, backcountry skiing one day and so just that cup anemometer, <laughs> the wind was howling and that cup anemometer was just in a broken, yeah, just in a solid block of ice. Yeah, it yeah, was, it's a, it's a tough thing to so do. So for it's, it, it is, it's very tricky. Yeah. All right, um, let's shift gears to talk about some uh, urban 
weather data here. So um, just in general, so we've talked about installations in, in other places, uh, in farmland and elsewhere. Um, how about weather stations to study urban weather? Yeah, the urban environment. Is the, urban weather a thing? Oh, are I we mean, looking at weather? We're we looking at microclimate. Well, I think that I think that you're hitting on exactly the right topic there, Chambers. Is that you are looking at microclimate and the microclimate variability in an urban setting is just tremendous. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, you better. So cite where, do you, that where thing. do you put where do you put your weather station? The top of a building? Is it going to give you similar conditions to what's happening on the street? Mm -hmm. Likely not. In a park? Yeah, I mean. Where, where do you where do you care where, where are people hanging out yeah, are they yeah. hanging out on right, the roof right probably not probably not probably hopefully hanging out in the park but they might be hanging out on the street mm -hmm. I mean this is um, th this is kind of the tricky part if you if you cite this thing in the park then it's going to probably read a little bit higher vapor pressure and relative humidity if you cite it on your roof it's probably going to read a little bit higher temperature especially in sunlight well an early part of the problem with early climate, climate change warnings was that the argument was that, well, all of these temperature measurements are biased towards urban or near urban areas mm -hmm. that are, that have heat island effects. Yeah. So that was, you know, back, what's my timeline like in the nineties, earlier than that, the, 80s, the people somewhere, started studying that. where, where there was a lot of concern about the, uh, about the bias in, in where weather stations were being measured. So, yeah. um, it's, I don't know if we have all the answers to this question. I mean, do we have just more questions? I, I don't. I, we have, yeah, a lot of questions. <laughs> That's for the the urban weather folks to answer those questions. I mean, typically in urban um, environment, you're going to have some network. You're going to have multiple locations where you're making these measurements. And so, if some of the measurements are in parks, if some of the me measurements are in a you know more you know kind of asphalt mm -hmm. type setting, if some are you know closer to buildings, then maybe you get a better integrated idea of what's going on and what the conditions, the felt conditions are in the um, right. in that environment. So would that include that one of these other questions? So you talked, you're hinting a, a lot about, you know, temperature and, you know, with heat islands and other things like that. Mm -hmm. Would this also impact uh, uh, wind speed data and oh, things sure. like if you're yeah. on a roof or, you know, being blocked by, by some other obstacle? Yeah, that's probably the most variable one. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're if you're sitting right next to a building and, and the wind's coming from the building direction, you're going to get obviously the wrong answer. Um, it, from that standpoint, having it up above the buildings would, would be best. But then, you know, are you it, it just depends on if, if you're wanting to, to understand how humans feel, what the what the operative temperature mm -hmm. or the, the felt temperature is at a certain location, then you're going to get the wrong answer if you put that up where there's a lot more wind speed. You're going to get the right answer if you put it down where the humans are hanging out. And then if you want to know whether there's an inversion going on, then you're looking at a completely different set yep. of data. Yep. Yeah, tricky stuff. That's this is why I um, this is why I have a, um, a weather station that's uh, at my house, so I know <laughs> exactly exactly what's going on all the time. Kind of a weather junkie, though. I mean, I pull out my phone every day and look and see what's going on outside and what happened, you know, the day before. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, this one, I don't know if we've we've hit this one specifically, but talking about comparing comparing results uh, between. Uh, standard rain gauges with a reed switch against all-in-one rain gauges. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about about comparing the two when necessary? I don't really see a dominant. Uh, it's kind of how you get to the measurement isn't quite as important as the other variables. Um, that, that's exactly that right. That are in there, I think. If the if the if the rain gauge is reading right, which you would assume that they all have been calibrated and, and can measure the amount of water that's come through them accurately. And I would make the statement that that's generally going to be true, no matter if it's a, you know, tipping bucket or tipping spoon gauge with a reed switch or, or, you know, any accumulating rain gauge. Really, your bigger errors and your bigger differences are going to come from things like the radius of your um, intake, right? So, Rain gauges with a smaller intake will miss more rain if you have higher wind speeds. And the differences are going to come from the 
uh, location, that the height that you mount the rain gauge at. So the higher the, the higher wind speed, the less uh, rain you're going to get. If you mount this thing at the ground surface or rain shield it, those are going to be much bigger effects than the accuracy of the rain gauge itself. Although it does affect the specs. I'm thinking about the resolution of, yeah. a, of a drip counter like in the Atmos yeah. 41. That's true. And uh, because that gets 0. 0.017, I yeah. think is our 0. smallest resolution. Millimeters. I've, I've never seen a tipping bucket or a reed switch that gets that kind of resolution. Mm-hmm. As we were, gosh, I remember chatting with a client, and uh, luckily they had leaf wetness sensors out there because, like, we're getting precipitation. We're this seeing morning, precipitation, and yeah. it has not rained. Mm-hmm. There's no precipitation gauge that is logging this, and they mm-hmm. were they were seeing dew. They were seeing kind of yeah. condensation in the funnel, and then it was dripping, and it would just make a few drips, like one every 15 minutes or something like that, yep. until it dried out, and that data. Was corroborated exactly by their leaf wetness sensors. By the leaf wetness sensors, sensors yep. so that, was, that was, those are the fun ones where, hey, this is what's happening. That's that's when support is fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when everything works, right? Yep. Or at least when you can figure out what's going on. Um, let's see. How about here is a. Uh, fine one. What what kind of weather equipment would be considered appropriate for a utility scale solar installation? Mm. Yeah, this is mm. this is a really interesting one. Been learning more about the um, renewables area and about you know these solar installations. And uh, by far the the number one most important is that class A pyranometer. I mean, you've got to know what solar radiation is coming in if you're going to determine any kind of efficiency from your solar measure it down to the jewel yeah exactly and then um a lot of people actually are adopting all-in-one weather stations to monitor the rest of the um weather parameters so none of the all-in-ones have that class a pyranometer Mm -hmm. you'd have to measure that separately but but an all-in-one is typically going to be um adequate to um, measure the rest of the environmental parameters, mm-hmm. except of course soiling. That's that's the other big one. You've got to somehow measure how much dust is accumulating on your on your solar panels, which um, hmm. that's a kind of a, a tricky one at this point. All right. All right. Let's see. We've got a few minutes left. We'll hit some of these these next ones here. Um, there. I'll, I'll get to this one in a second. Um, there are a couple questions, um, a couple questions asking about in general. Just a, a, again, uh, we've talked about ET um, already a little bit, but specifically about how does ET work with uh, with meters, weather stations, and within Zentra Cloud and those models. And just mm-hmm. can you talk a little bit about about how those work specifically within Zentra Cloud? Yeah, basically we implement. FAO 56, mm-hmm. right? Exactly. And so if you if you want to learn uh, like the nuts and bolts about it, um, it's an FAO. You're going to look for FAO 56 um, based off of the penman Monteith equation. Mm-hmm. And actually, I think that um, Colin Campbell and Dirk Baker did a webinar, yeah, yeah. a joint webinar with uh, Campbell Scientific about mm-hmm. measuring evapotranspiration. And so that's a pretty good reference. And I right. think they reference some you know, literature that, that helps with that as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brad, were you asking about, were they asking about um, Zentra Cloud as well? Yeah, yeah. So okay. they're asking about how does that work in Zentra Cloud yeah, right now? Yeah, so it's it's super easy in Zentra Cloud. All you have to do is is apply one of the, what do we call them, scientific models. Yep, and say, the models. Say, give me ETO or ETR. You can have the, the alfalfa reference or the, or the grass reference. Wait, and it will, do all, it will do all the calculations. Oh, Man, I, I have a 50% yeah. chance of uh, <laughs> getting it right. Yeah. <laughs> and then it just asks you which sensor you want to use for the measurements and uh, then the time scale. And then on a daily, it's a daily model. So uh, that throws people off sometimes. It, it sums the the ET at the end of the day. Yeah. I mean, but that's FAO 56. Yep, that's exactly. the way that, it, that it's recommended. Exactly. So that's the way that we have to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, super simple though. It's way easier than calculating it yourself. I can tell you that. Or putting a ten thousand dollar eddy covariance station yeah. out there, right? Mm-hmm. All right. Along with uh, uh, Zentra Cloud, again, this individual is asking: Will Zentra Cloud eventually facilitate additional metadata? We talked about metadata, mm-hmm. so having yeah additional site pictures, uh, maintenance, um, all within uh, your your account there. Pictures are on the list. It's just not that we're not there yet. Yeah, it's. Uh, 
a balancing that that ease of use versus uh, versus utility. Um, but we, we know how important that is to be able to see what's happening at, mm-hmm. your, at your site. Um, so yeah, it's a is intercloud is a living, breathing, uh, developing software that we're actively investing effort into, and I am excited to see how it grows over the coming years. Yep. And so, I mean, the the question was asking about facilitating additional metadata. It said mm-hmm. site, you know, pictures and things, but um, but I did mention earlier that our metadata feed has come a long way. So there is a lot of self diagnostics, and when you're asking about maintenance. Um, like you did, then then those um, self-diagnosing measurements are pretty helpful with that. It will tell you immediately, hey, something's going on. Time for maintenance. <clears throat> oh, I love this question. I don't know if I have all the answers for it. Uh, to what extent does the soil life, such as mycorrhizae, fungi, affect the amount of water the soil can hold, and how do you include this variable in your measurements? That is... Uh, <laughs> that's great. Um, we don't really include things like that in the the research on mycorrhizae are are in kind of a fantastic stage right now where there's a lot of new things coming out every day. Um, so we know they affect the amount of water that the soil can hold, and n- not so much that how much the plants can take up. Yeah, and how much sharing happens between plants. Um, I. I don't know. I'm going to keep my eye on the research over the next few years, I hope, and yeah. so, see how that develops. I mean, when you're talking about those fungal interactions, often you're talking about the, the soil structure, right, and, mm-hmm. and water holding capacity, which if you're measuring just water content, that doesn't get you all the way. Um, I, I mean, it tells you about the water balance, but but if you're talking about you know plants or microbes then your water potential measurement is going to be a, a more important one and so at, at that point you maybe don't care as much about how much water is there and and what the the fungal effects are but you you can what the actually, availability yeah is. you can yeah. actually nail the availability and that's the how key much bit. energy needs to be exerted to to extract that water and yep and then the effects like you mentioned the effects that they have on the soil in terms of soil structure and uh, soil microbial activity, those are, well, those y- are the fun questions You know, the, the, it's interesting that, that people now are starting to co-locate water content and water potential sensors in the soil, mm-hmm. and then you can actually drive the moisture characteristic curve, and that moisture characteristic curve, or the relationship between water content and water potential for a given soil, will evolve over time, and I think that's what this question is really getting at, is you know, the water holding capacity is determined by that, um, by that moisture characteristic curve. So yep. pe- people are measuring those in situ. Mm-hmm. All right. Okay. Um, I think maybe we'll do two more questions here. Um, this one, I know we, t- we touched on uh, installation. They're just wondering, do they have to use uh, meter gouge augers uh, with Teros installations? No. Okay. No, I mean you can you can install the sensors in in many different ways. The the old tried and true is you know dig a big trench down to the depth you want to. And some people install. still really like that because sure. they get to see the soil profile. You get to get soil yep. samples at exactly at the depth, and all of that is important, yep. especially with and, water content. And sensors. you can tell you know when you insert it if you've hit a rock or hit a root or mm-hmm. you know or if you have some some type of problem. So. Um, so no, you don't have to use the borehole installation tool. It's just a really handy way to get a good, good quality installation. And focus on soil to sensor contact. If you do nothing else in, install, in installing your soil moisture sensors, make sure you get good contact with the soil. All right. And we did get uh, some information from our friend and colleague, Leo Rivera. That auger in question is specific to the Taro 6. Oh, so it's, that, it's, yeah, that's the, the soil temperature profile sensor. That's a whole different beast from the from the water content sensor. And the answer is still no. You don't have to use that. It is recommended because it's the same size as the, yeah. as the thing. Hey, we answered the wrong question. I but, know. but we had a lot of fun answering the question. It was, it was, I, answered the question I wanted to <laughs> answer. Sue me. That's right. What we learn is the friends along the way. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, final, final question here, I think, and we're going to combine these two. And this is just about dealing with some fun and exotic installations. Um, one is asking about installing on a glacier surface. 
and the mm. other is um, in active volcanic areas. So any insights in, in those two? Are these coming things? from somebody in Iceland that would be installing <laughs> on a glacier in, on a, glacier glacier in a volcano? <laughs> yeah. Well, the active volcanic areas, that, that one's going to be a tough one just from the standpoint of, of measuring rainfall. I mean, any, any type of, of ash fall or, or dust accumulation is, is certainly going to gum up your, your rain gauge. Mm -hmm. And even if you're using a weighing rain gauge, it's going to give you, you know, some, some accumulation that's not actually rain. It would be, mm -hmm. you know, solid material that's accumulating. So that's going to be a pretty tough one. The rest of the measurements ought to be okay if you clean your pyranometer pretty often. I mean, yeah. your, your solar radiation Dust is going to... covering solar radiation yeah. is going to be a problem. Yeah, um, tough one. But I mean, anytime you're doing research or, or, or monitoring anything in a volcanic area, that's kind of a special case, and you better be prepared to do a little bit of extra work, I mm -hmm. think. What about the glacier? The glacier, mm -hmm. uh, watch your metadata. Mm -hmm. The Atmos 41 has accelerometers on it, so you'll know if uh, you get some movement and it comes out of out of level. Yeah, exactly. And you need to truck back some on there. Differential melting and you're at a tilt. You yep. know, that's something where cloud access is so helpful for, for keeping an eye on your site, knowing when there's a problem, for troubleshooting. Uh, you know, and then if you run into a problem and you see it in the cloud, then you yep. can just truck right out there yep. and, and fix it with a minimal loss of data. Uh, you know, but sometimes those are your cell signal is focused on areas where people are. Yeah. Um, you know, so it might just might not be an option uh, on the surface of a glacier, depending on where it is. In that, in that case, you better get out there pretty often. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think we have come up to the end of the hour here, so that's going to wrap it up for us. And, uh, yeah, we just want to say thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed this discussion. Um, thanks again. Yeah, yeah, I had a good time. It was good fun. Yeah, yeah. Nice <laughs> um, yeah, thanks again for all the great questions. We had a bunch that, that were submitted. Um, we got through almost all of them, so that that was great. Good job. Good job, Chris. Good yeah, job, thanks. Doug. Um, props to you guys. Um, for those in the audience, please consider answering the short survey that will appear after we close here, just to let us know what types of Q&A themes you'd like to see in the future. And for more information, definitely on what you've heard today, please visit us at metergroup.com. Finally, look for the recording of today's presentation in your email and stay tuned for future Meter Office Hours events. Thanks again. Stay safe and have a great day. Ciao. Bye-bye.